Welcome. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. So if you're on campus, by now you likely know that we have our annual art auction on Saturday. This Saturday, yes. And the live auction segment runs from uh, 12 noon to 1 o'clock here in Shermer. And all the works are available for preview today before you leave campus. So if you haven't seen the works, the live auction works are up in our main office building, and the silent auction works are just right nearby in the Wiley Painting Building. So take a look, and uh, we look forward to seeing you here on Saturday. Before we begin, I would like to thank all of our sponsors with a very special thanks to Jill and Jay Bernstein. And and to Marilyn and Larry Fields, yeah. <laughs> who have sponsored today's program. Introducing our, our featured artist is Andrea Wallace. Many of you know Andrea. She is the artistic director of our photography and new media program. And Andrea is also chair of our workshops program for all of you who have attended our workshops. And she's involved in our Art and Artist Advisory Committee that brings these great programs to you. Andrea is a photographer, an established, experienced photographer in her own right. She has exhibited widely throughout the Americas, in Europe and as far away as China. And she has two exhibitions opening later this year, one at the Western Colorado Center for the Arts in Grand Junction, and that opens around Thanksgiving. And then, actually, it's next year, she has an exhibition opening at Skidmore College in January. Andrea. Thank you, Nancy. Um, as the Artistic Director of Phot uh, Photography and New Media at the ranch, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's featured artist, Alex Soth. Uh, yesterday, while I was talking to Alec, uh, we started to talk about painting. And he told me he was a failed painter. And he said that he realized uh, he would need to spend at least 10 years learning the fundamentals of painting and so he, before he could move on to content. So he decided to switch to photography so he could access uh, content more readily and immediately. And I think all of us in this room are really glad that he did. Um, in an article in the New York Times, Julian Cox, curator of photography at the High Museum, was quoted saying that Alec communes with his subjects and his environment through the ritual of the photographic act. He's a very natural type of communicator. That's part of his magic formula for having his subjects turn themselves over to him. He was born and raised in Minnesota, where he continues his work today. He maintains a shy yet highly celebrated presence with the contemporary art world. And the publication of his first book, Sleeping by the Mississippi, caught the attention of the art world and influenced his successful inclusion into the 2004 Whitney and Sao Paulo biennials. In 2008, a large survey exhibition of Alex Worth was exhibited at the Jus de Palme in Paris and Photo Museum Winterthur in Switzerland. And additionally, in 2008, Alex started his own publishing company, Little Brown Mushroom. He's represented by Sean Kelly in New York, the Weinstein Gallery in Minneapolis, Franco Gallery in San Francisco, and is a member of Magnum Photos. His work is in, previous, is in various public and private collections, including the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, the Minneapolis Institute of Art, oh, my earring fell out, and the Walker Art Center. Uh, and there's currently an exhibition of Alex Worth work on view at the Denver Art Museum. Alec, it's been a delight to have you here this week and to uh, entertain Rachel and Carmen and Gus. And I really thank you for making the time to share your work with us. Please join me in welcoming Alex Soth. Thank you. Thanks so much, and thanks for revealing that I'm a failed painter. That's nice. <laughs> um, and thanks to the Bernsteins and, and the Fields for uh, their hospitality, as well as everyone here. This is such a friendly, amazing group of people. Um, Uh-oh, hang on. Bear with me. 
Oh, I hate it when this happens. Oh, sorry. I uh, just want to check out something interactive. Okay, we're good on that. We're going to go like this. There we go, like that. Okay, uh, so the title of my talk is From Here to There, and this is also the name of, of a survey exhibition that I, that I had uh, about five years ago, and it's, and it's also sort of my working process of, of one thing leading to the next. Um, one of the first projects I did was called From Here to There, and, and my kind of, the artist statement for this project was actually made by Robert Frank, who said the project I have in mind is one that will shape itself as it proceeds and is essentially elastic. Uh, <laughs> which is a great way of saying, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Um, but uh, I, I built off this idea with this project from here to there. And the idea was that one picture leads to the next. So you have a boy with a chicken, a boy with an egg. He has a Superman tattoo. You'll see a Superman suit, and, and so on and so forth. This was in the early days of, of the internet and, and web surfing, and I like this idea of web surfing in the real world. Um, but th the problem with these kind of links is that they were, too, they were too easy, too specific. So I started making bigger leaps. And I, I switched to color at this time. So here's a picture at the world's smallest church in Spillville, Iowa. And then I went to the world's smallest church in, uh, in the southern coast of Iceland. Um, so huge leaps. And it was during that process, you know, one thing led to another, led to another, and I ended up making this picture. This is uh, Charles Lindbergh's boyhood bed uh, in Minnesota. And, and so when I, would, when I would take a picture, I would do research to figure out where it's going to lead me. And, and as I was driving to, to his house, I, I was reading his autobiography, and he talked about how, as a boy, he and his father had planned to make this trip down the Mississippi River. And I'd, I'd made a number of river trips in the past, and I thought, well, maybe I should just change this from here to there idea into a project along the Mississippi River. But really, it's not, a, not doing a documentary of the river, but using the river as a metaphor for this kind of uh, serendipitous wandering. So this picture, uh, which is probably the best known picture from Sleeping by the Mississippi, is very much linked to that picture of Charles Lindbergh's boyhood bed. It, uh, you know, he's in a flight suit, he's got, the, he's got the airplanes. Oddly enough, his name is Charles as well, which I love, and I love that this kind of play beneath the surface of the photograph that's, that's more for me than for anyone else, but this linking of pictures. So uh, books were really important to me. I made a number of early maquettes of this book, and, and then um, it eventually got published, and there have been several editions of it. And I can talk more about bookmaking later. Um, but since this, I've done you know, a lot of different projects, too many for a 45-minute lecture. And, and I've also given a lot of lectures, and I don't want to repeat myself. Um, my, this, is, this is my ambition. Uh, so what I've been doing is I've, I've, I've created this spin wheel in which I can uh, pick different subjects. Uh, and so if we have time, we'll go to the spin wheel. But I'm going to just, <laughs> I'm going to talk for a second, or more than a second, about my most recent project. So I'm going to skip way ahead to the last three and a half years of work, uh, which actually started with this book, uh, this, this is a guy named Erwin Norling, who was a suburban newspaper photographer in Minnesota. And this fellow, Brad Zeller, uncovered this treasure trove of his pictures in a, in a box in the, in the basement of a historical society and found these incredible treasures and unearthed them. And I ended up writing the introduction for this book. Uh, and in this introduction, I talked about the fact that I had once been a suburban newspaper photographer. And wouldn't it be interesting to now, sort of knowing what I know now, uh, 
approach that, those subjects in the same way. And so it was on my, uh, on my birthday uh, three and a half years ago where I, I called Brad Zeller and I said, I want you to give me a present. And I want you to go with me and we'll cover just a dumb suburban story. And you'll be the writer and I'll be the photographer. And it was a story about this uh, cat that had been lost and uh, the police found him on this freeway interchange on Christmas Day, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we had so much fun that we started doing more of this. Um, and so, so this, for example, is the, uh, the last snow globe repairman. <laughs> this was the, an optimist club meeting uh, in suburban Minnesota. Their, their featured speaker was talking about overpopulation and was perhaps the least optimistic speech I'd ever seen in my life. Uh, St. Patrick's Day dance. Uh, and then I started doing more of this work on my own without Brad as well. I did a project with other Magnum photographers in Rochester, New York, and I was really focused on community life in America um, and, and how we connect ourselves in, in churches and in uh, fraternal organizations, etc. And then uh, one thing led to another, and I had, a, I had a lecture opportunity in Ohio, and I asked Brad, the writer, if he'd join me, and we would take our, this idea of doing a newspaper on the road. So we did a two-week two trip around Ohio, and every day, you know, I would post pictures on Tumblr, and he would write stories. And, and again, we were focusing on community life, so this is a... Uh, evangelical church, um, Baptist church, uh, prom. Uh, we spent one day at a moose lodge. This is Brad actually becoming a moose uh, at, at the end of the day, which he holds over me to this day. Uh, and so immediately after this trip, we published a newspaper. And, and the sales of this newspaper paid our expenses, and it was this incredible experience of, of doing the work we wanted to do and self-funding it. And so we started doing more of these. And our inspiration was really something kind of old-fashioned, something like Life magazine. This is Eugene Smith's uh, famous Country Doctor magazine essay. And one of the things I realized, because I've been involved in, in publishing and self-publishing for a long time, and I realized that this is still a viable format for communicating information. Um, and, and through this process, did research on so many different photographer and writer collaborations. Uh, Dorothea Lange and Paul Taylor, Margaret Burke White, and, and Erskine Caldwell, and of course, A.G. and Evans. And surprisingly, like this book uh, by Dorothea Lange really has that a very similar quality to what we were doing in our dispatch work. Just little snippets of text and these faces. Um, so our next project was in upstate New York. In upstate, it was, it was less about community life than this than its history. I mean, you can feel the history in upstate. It's so much deeper than it is out west, for example. Um, and there's kind of this mythology that rides beneath it. So it's, it was a little bit more mysterious. This is a, a Sufi um, uh, shepherd in upstate, originally from Harlem. One interesting thing is that I was able then to take a picture like that and show it to the New York Times Magazine and have them publish it. But So I was turning turning the tables in a way, rather than being commissioned by a magazine, doing the work on my own terms, and then publishing it, which was kind of thrilling as well. So this is the upstate issue. Uh, our, for the next, uh, next one, we did Michigan. And this was at the time of the, of the election. And we, we kind of used that as part of the structural backbone for the project. This is uh, actually right here where that bench is. Uh, 
there's a, there's a plaque, and it's called uh, Under the Oaks, which is the birthplace of the Republican Party. This is in downtown Detroit, uh, this is an asparagus farmer. And so with, with all these trips, we, we used an assistant, but in the case of Michigan, we partnered with Cranbrook and worked with their grad students. Uh, so, so two of them on the left uh, traveled with us, one for each week, and the two on the right were making prints for a pop-up exhibition at the end of the trip. And this was, this was really thrilling, is to have the work on the walls almost immediately after we traveled. I continue doing other work uh, with, with Magnum, and we can talk about Magnum later, but uh, this is, I did a, a project in Orlando uh, dealing with these motels, these older motels, uh, on the edges of, of Disney World that now largely house uh, nearly homeless families. You know, school buses pull up to the motels. Uh, another project uh, dealing with World War I. Uh, I had to figure out a, a solution to photographing World War I for a commission, and I ended up working with uh, Descendants of the Choctaw code talkers, which were the first people to use uh, code language uh, in, in military action. Um, and then was commissioned by the uh, New York Times Magazine to do a project in North Dakota, in, in Williston, North Dakota, on the oil boom. It's a Walmart. And so it was great, too, to be able to then have this, this new way of working and, and have a magazine want to use that. Uh, so I, I had great freedom on this assignment. I'll talk a little bit about uh, our next project, which was Colorado. So what, what Brad and I would do is we would plan a route and research not just where those green dots are, but every spot along the route on a, on a variety of themes. We would just sort of brainstorm. So. This is just like a quick brainstorm that we did of stuff that we're looking for as we drive. Um, all this kind of stuff is, is, I mean, that's my way of working, is, is these kind of keywords as I'm driving. Um, I also did visual research. We were so inspired by uh, FSA photographers and, and there's wonderful archives that you can search online of FSA, FSA photographs. So Arthur Rothstein in Colorado, um, Mary Post Walcott as well. But the big, the big thing I had in mind with Colorado was hitchhikers for some reason. This was the thing I was excited about, and and it's kind of tied to, you know, the beats and uh, and hitting the road and going west and Kerouac and all of that. I actually did find a couple. They're not that easy to find anymore. But This guy to me is the quintessential Colorado character. I mean, he, lo <laughs> <laughs> he looks like Bob Denver to me. Um, and, and Bob Denver became this, you know, this thing for us because Brad is a huge music fan and, and would research music in, in the different states we'd go. But, Denver's tough because it's like a lot of jam bands, you know, and uh, and so we did it, you know, we we made this part of our journey. Um, this is in Boulder. I can't remember the town that this is in. Um, with each trip, I would change up slightly the, my approach photographically. So uh, I decided to photograph vertically for all of the pictures in Colorado. So hard to photograph the landscape and to sort of get at the immensity of it. Leadville. This is one of my favorite pictures. Um, 
that I've ever taken, actually. And it's a uh, really touching story. The, um, Dave, the fellow on the left, I met him, and uh, he invited me to his house, and he really wanted to give me this book on the Beats. And, he, and, I, and I said, no, 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 you know, like, I don't need it, you know, please keep it. And he was very insistent, so generous. And I took the book, and, um, and what's interesting to me about the, the picture is that it looks like a beat, like a beat apartment, sort of. Um, and at any rate, a couple months later, I got a call from Trish, the woman on the right, uh, and, and David died. He'd fallen down a flight of stairs and, and died. Uh, it's just so heartbreaking. Um, and so much of what f photographs are about to me is is memory and the information that's hidden, too. You know, the faces are hidden. You don't see everything that's there, but you project onto it. And, uh, and having that story been behind it is so powerful to me. Um, this is also in Leadville. Uh, so that was the Colorado Dispatch. Um, so this is a show uh, right now at the Denver Art Museum. Um, so I've done a number of shows this year of, of all of this work, which I'll talk about in a second, but we've done a couple shows uh, of the individual projects. So we're going to do another one uh, later in the fall of the Georgia Dispatch. I'll show that work in a second. Oh, I just wanted to show this to you, because this is a funny little footnote to the Colorado work, which is that a Russian Esquire uh, contacted us and they, they wanted me to do a fashion story. And, and I said, well, what if we did it on the road while doing a dispatch? This was help fund our dispatch work. So uh, Brad, the writer, actually became the model. <laughs> and so while we're reporting and doing our job, uh, each day Brad would have to get in a, you know, a $2,000 outfit and... <laughs> And tromp around, and we had a stylist with us, and the whole thing. Um, this one's great. Uh, I mean, his shoes were so expensive, and he's out there trudging in the mud. It's so funny. Uh, at any rate, our uh, our next dispatch was in uh, California, but. California is too big. We decided to do just three valleys. And this started with the commission with uh, SF MoMA to work in Silicon Valley. So we did Silicon Valley. This is actually on the campus of Facebook. Uh, San Joaquin Valley. And then finally, Death Valley. Uh, so it's called Three Valleys. Texas also chopped that up and uh, just did the Texas Triangle of the, of the major cities. Uh, so this is in San Antonio. Uh, this is after an execution. Just going quickly through this stuff. And then, and then finally, the final dispatch was in Georgia. Um, so this is a, a school for the, or camp for the blind. Uh, and in this case, we actually partnered with the New York Times Magazine, um, which was great. And it was kind of this interesting process of starting from something, this little self-published newspaper, and then it got bigger and bigger, and we're partnering with all these institutions, and then finally we're publishing you know, in the New York Times. That's, that's Jimmy Carter on the left. What was kind of interesting is to, is to work in that suburban newspaper style, you know, really dumb and straightforward. And so taking a picture of Jimmy Carter that's not like, you know, every presidential portrait. Um, that was really my ambition with this work. So those are all the dispatches. And then all of this work uh, was compiled. So that dispatch work, as well as the projects I did uh, outside of it, was compiled in something called Songbook. And Songbook actually is about stripping away all that text, stripping away all the backstory, and letting the, the key pictures function like songs, like uh, the, these springboards for, for the imagination. Um, so it looks like this, and I've had a number of exhibitions that look kind of like that. Um, ah, how are we doing on time? So we go till 1.30, right? So I'm going to take a spin of the wheel.
shall we? So check this out. We're not going to start with Alex Trice. <laughs> okay, children's books. Uh, so, so then over here, I have, okay, I have all these mini lectures prepared. Children's books. <laughs> Bear with me. Sorry for the people that are in the cafeteria. They're probably very confused about what's happening. Um, uh -oh. oh, I see a problem already. Those are tiny. Okay, so, uh, so one of the things that I realized with photography is that it could function with text, but how, did, how can it function best? And I realized that children's books were such a great way of pairing image, image and text. Uh, and I started collecting photographic children's books. Excuse me, the slide's really tiny. Um, the one on the right is a little golden book. A lot of, a lot of you probably know those. And, um, and I, I, well, I'll talk about those in a second. And, and also the spirit of being a child. So this is uh, Lartigue talking about photographing uh, at age six in 1900. And that kind of spirit is really essential to being a photographer. And we kind of forget about it now uh, that it's so commonplace. But look at these Lartigue pictures. They're really amazing. So uh, I, a number of years ago when my daughter was seven, uh, I collaborated with her on a project in England. And it's a long story. I was commissioned to photograph there, uh, and then I was forbidden from working because I, I had visa problems. So I had my daughter take all the pictures instead. <laughs> and, and so we would go on these walks. And I was really blown away by the quality of her pictures. Um, so this actually is a William Eggleston photograph. And you, know, you, can, see the, you can see the similarity. And, and here again is a Lartigue picture. That's a pretty sweet photograph. Um, and one of the interesting things is, is her perspective, you know, because you get this other view of the world. Oh, this is, yeah, very small video of her at work. Just note everything she misses going on behind her. Uh, <laughs> So, um, again, this is her pictures. But it's one of the things that I, I was really interested in is how, easy, you know, how kids can take really great pictures, in fact. Editing them is different. Um, but look at this photograph she took, really amazing. She called these walk-bys. Um, again, a Lartigue picture. So this is called Brighton Picture Hunt. Um, but one, one thing happened on this trip. It's too bad my kids aren't here. They're at horseback riding right now. But uh, my son was jealous about this. And so we needed to do something. So we, we did this other little book called The Brighton Bunny Boy. And it was actually a real interesting lesson about photography, because those pictures with my daughter uh, you know, existed without text. And, but my kids also wanted to make this storybook. And, and in, in many ways, this storybook has lived on in a way that those other pictures haven't in their imagination. Uh, once there was a girl who went to Brighton, England with her family. Since she didn't have school and didn't have a friend, she liked to take walks. She took lots and lots of pictures. In the newspaper, she read a story about a strange creature. The people were freaked out. He was a bunny, but he had the face of a boy. The boy was so embarrassed of his human face that he stayed away from everyone. He was so lonely. So my daughter wrote this and took the pictures. One day on a walk, the girl saw the bunny boy, but he ran away. She followed him to his hideaway on the top of the hill. She even followed him into his secret basement bedroom. The girl said to the bunny boy, don't be afraid, I'm lonely too. 
I don't have any friends either. Will you be my friend? The bunny boy. But aren't you freaked out? Of course not. You seem like a very sweet bunny boy. <laughs> they took a walk together. For the next five days, the girl visited the bunny boy. They liked each other a lot, but he still wouldn't show his face. The girl asked the bunny boy to come home with her, but, she was too, but he was too scared. She came back the next day and said, tomorrow's Easter. Everyone loves bunnies on Easter. Will you come home with me? The bunny boy said yes. The girl and the bunny boy rode home in the bus. I love how she would draw herself into the picture. <laughs> on Easter, the bunny boy showed his face. Um, but what's interesting about that, again, is the, is this, the power of storytelling and the way it, it holds a child's imagination. Uh, and so it's, it's been my goal to try to figure out, to play with text and figure out ways that it, it can work uh, with images. And this is a picture just from uh, a few months ago in Portland, Oregon. I, I collaborated with uh, this school in Portland, uh, and they, they actually produced an uh, exhibition of photographs by Magnum photographers, and they edited, uh, they, they selected all of the photographs. They created this museum within their school, and the kids functioned as curators. And it was really a meaningful event. But I also collaborated, I, I ended up plucking out this one girl named Cherish, uh, eight-year-old girl, and we, we produced a book together. Uh, this is at the opening. Uh, so this book is not really published, it's an edition of two. Cherish has one, I have one. It says, I hate my life. I'm going to skip that one.
So that's the book we made. Uh, that's, that's the end of my children's book discussion. Uh, Narrative. Uh, that really relates to children's books. Uh, let's, see, let's see what I got on the narrative talk. Oh, I got multiple lectures in narrative. Uh, okay, I'm going to go fast through this. This is Eric Kessel's project, Every Picture Downloaded in Flickr in 24 Hours. This to me is the ultimate representation of the problem of being a photographer right now. Um, how do you... How do you make something meaningful? Robert Frank talked about how there are too many images, too many cameras now. Uh, maybe photography isn't an art anymore. Maybe it never was. It's not very cheery. Um, Tobias Wolf talking about we're in an unceasing flow of time and events and people. And to make a sense of what goes past, we put a beginning and an end to certain things. Um, that's the only way we give it significance, by creating stories. So people talk about narrative photography, and they, they often talk about someone like Gregory Crutzen, but I don't think it's actually narrative in, any more so than any other photograph. It's, uh, it suggests a story, but it doesn't tell a story. Now I'm going to skip this just to move fast. Uh, you know, so is this storytelling, Muybridge? Uh, not exactly. Um, you know, we think of a story as having an arc, a dramatic arc. But most photographs function like this. Bam, 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 bam. Someone like the Bechers, typology. And even Cartier-Bresson's decisive moment is really a collection of greatest hits. It doesn't have an arc. So how do you get at this? You know, maybe Dwayne Michaels. Uh, you know, but this is kind of corny when you look at stuff like this. Uh, these are photo romanzis, which I actually collect. Uh, perhaps something like this is better. And that's when I think about something like The Country Doctor. This is the ultimate uh, example to me of photographic storytelling, which is Robert Frank's The Americans. Connecting the dots through a road trip is one, is one way, one strategy. I'm going to skip that. These are all my books. So, you know, I have uh, Sleeping by the Mississippi. That's an easy strategy. You've got a river connecting the dots. Niagara, still a region. But what about this? Connect the dots. Okay. Connect the dots. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I, I already talked about storybooks, and so with Little Brown Mushroom, we've, we've created a series of, of these narrative books that combine image and text, and using that style of little golden books for children. Uh, that's my little story, my narrative talk. I'm going to throw in, how about a question? I'm told you guys love to ask questions, and if you don't, I'm going to spin the wheel again. Do we have a question? We have people with microphones. There's one. Hi. Did you buy your daughter her own camera, or did you give her yours? Uh, I gave my daughter my own camera, so a professional camera, but you put it on, you know, program mode. And, and, and the great lesson, as I said, is that children... <coughs> can make great pictures, but they tend not to be able to edit them. So she probably took, you know, 3,000 photographs. And if she had edited them, you would see a lot of puppies, you know? And, <laughs> and a lot of blurry puppies, too. Uh, so I'm, you know, I'm selecting out the key pictures. Uh, but this, this actually goes uh, to the, when I, in the introduction, talking about getting to content faster. I mean, the tools are so great now um, that, you know, there is still a learning curve with the technology, but you can just dig in and, and work on content very quickly, and I love that. Other questions? Yeah, over here.
How do you see that a project or a story is ever complete or finished? And then do you think a book, creating a book is a way to kind of find a closure in that or? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, the, you know, the real, the real struggle is that, you know, unlike a novel uh, or a movie, it, you can create a shape to it, but there really isn't resolution ever. Um, but at least the structure of a book helps, you know, it, it gives it some sort of physical beginning and end. And that is what I love about bookmaking. Um, but there's always this, this frustration because it's, it, there's never a natural ending and it's so much more intuitive. Uh, and this last book, Songbook, I thought a lot about that and the, and this, the analogy between photography and music in some ways and, and how one might put an album together. And, and it's, it's done as much by feeling as by anything else. Yeah. Other questions? Or I'm going to spin the wheel. This guy's got one. Okay. Well, I think I'm told that there are people listening out in the cafeteria and they need to hear your voice. Is that not true? That's, yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the, the use of the, the, this? Intense flash, both as an aesthetic choice, but also how that interacts with your these more candid scenes. Sure. As far as um, yeah. So what you know, most of what I showed you is is all more recent work with this intense flash. I'm, you know, I made my reputation using a large format camera, uh, no lighting, you know, natural lighting, uh, or if very soft fill lighting, and. Um, and I love working with that tool, but so my thing about being a photographer is that, and this is one frustration with being a photographer versus being, say, a painter. Like a painter is usually not identified with what paint they use or what kind of brush they use. But photographers, you know, because it's, you, you're using technology, you're so often tied to that technology. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I sort of promoted that early on, but then I got frustrated because it was it was limiting me, uh, and I wanted to, you know, if be like a filmmaker that makes one movie in 35 millimeter and another movie, you know, another documentary, you know, using a handheld camera or something, um, and I wanted that flexibility and that change of voice, and that was a key thing too, is that uh, is to not have not always have the same voice, you know. There's a, something with the kind of slow, methodical process of large format photography that, that gives the work a, a, a sense of tranquility and quietness. Um, and I like that, but I'm not always tranquil and quiet. And, uh, and I wanted this other kind of energy. And the f you know, so the use of flash is key in that, because flash is like the opposite. It's uh, you're projecting light onto the subject, and you're, you're kind of attacking the subject in a certain way. And I wanted that aggressiveness which is also connected to newspaper photography. Another question back here. Oh, and then we have I one. Oh, she's got a microphone all ready to roll. Yeah, thank you. Um, does Little Brown Mushroom Publishing House publish only your works or other photographers? No, works? not at all. Uh, maybe I'll throw in a little Little Brown Mushroom stuff here. because I. Um, so the whole idea of Little Brown Mushroom is is to have this playground, you know, this have this this arena where I can just goof around, and it's not the high stakes art world. It's small, inexpensive little things, and we can try stuff out, and we can collaborate. And it's you know, being a photographer is very much about working in isolation usually. And um, so here's some of us. It's kind of a changing cast of characters, um, including a designer who's not in this picture. Uh, and early on, I didn't know what I was doing, and I just made these little zines by myself, and I was, I was goofing around with that. Um, by the way, there's another bunny. Bunny Boy Goes to Rome was the follow-up. Uh, I talked about these already. Uh, I did a men's magazine. I, I didn't want it to just be children's books. I wanted to flip it the other way, and uh, so I did a men's magazine. I'll leave that to your imagination, what that could be. Um, and I was really, I, to use the music analogy, I was thinking about 
this kind of spectrum uh, between, you know, sort of refined, you know, vinyl, limited edition work, which is like fine artwork, and then something that's cheaper and more mass market. And, uh, and, and so I wanted to work in that area, and our little brown mushroom books are kind of down in that area, sort of tactile things, not totally mass market, um, but not super refined and exclusive. So we made this poster, for example, that comes in individual sheets uh, that we sold for $25. And then, you know, kids all over the place send us pictures of, you know, how they pasted them up and whatnot. But it's not just my work. Um, uh, this is a Little Brown Mushroom workshop we did in Japan. So th this, is, uh, this is a book that we created with found photographs that people can assemble themselves. And, and it actually dealt with an American in Japan, these, uh, this album of photographs I found. And so the, these people are constructing their own narrative out of this book. Um, to, to go on about the, the, the music analogy, um, I think of photography now as functioning like music, where you have you know, Instagram, which is this sort of free platform, like digital download. You have the book, which is like vinyl. And then you have something like a live event, but a show is, is one kind of live event. I've gotten much more interested now in an actual live event. So this, these are posters for Nan Golden's Ballad of Sexual Dependency, and I thought about the slideshow as a live event. Um, so here's Nan Golden actually giving a presentation of that. Um, and, and so one, just to answer your question, all these books back here, wherever they were, uh, well, you know, all those books that I showed are different artists. So none of the, that series is, is with me. Um, those are all different photographers, different writers, uh, and they're collaborating to figure out, and we're collaborating with the designer and so forth to figure out narrative strategies. Um, a couple years ago, we did this summer camp, and this is, this is going into this area of live events, which I'm really excited about. It's where I'm moving Little Brown Mushroom right now. So a couple of years ago, we did this, the summer camp for socially awkward storytellers. So we invited uh, 15 artists from around the world for this free camp. Uh, and you know, they met and worked together and then went out in the world and gathered stories. That's Brad Zeller and myself on the right. And, and then at the end of the camp, we had this live show where they had to present their stories in front of an audience. And it was super exciting and, and stressful. Um, and one of the things I'm working on now is something called the Winnebago Workshop. And so what we're doing is we're, we're going to work with teenagers and we're creating this mobile storytelling lab. Uh, we're actually doing our, our first pilot run of this in two weeks. And then they'll go back into the community in which they created the stories and they'll project them on the side of the RV. So there's some information online about the project. And and so it's, Little Brown Mushroom is totally about collaboration. It's not just a vehicle for my own stuff. And so books, and my big book, Songbook, and all the others are never published, self-published, because uh, I want real publishers who know what they're doing to do it. Another, oh, now the hands are flying left and right. We'll get back to you, but the microphone's close here. Uh, my question is about how you interact with your human subjects. How do you entice them to engage with the camera in a way that doesn't feel like you're pushing them to, to perform in some way or behave in a manner outside of how they are? Mm -hmm. One of the most popular questions, so I have a slideshow ready for that, <laughs> uh, which I think we call strangers. How do you photograph? Oh, this is not going to work, I think. It's missing. So you have a camera. This, okay. This is, Ouija, this is Ouija talking. Uh, Ouija is a huge inspiration for me. You make good pictures. Everybody likes them. But you have to get out of the class where you only photograph your friends and relatives indoors. That's very nice. But if you want to do it professionally, and I don't see any reason why you shouldn't, 
Go out and photograph strangers. I know you're afraid to do it at first. I was scared stiff myself, but you have to do it. And most people like to be photographed. They consider it an honor to be picked out of a big crowd. In other words, you can't be a nice nally and, and do photography. So those were really important words for me. You can't be a nice Nelly. Um, I was terrified to photograph people. I didn't do it when I was in school. And, and I realized that I had to face this. If I was going to be a professional photographer, like Ouija said, I had to learn how to do it. And so I started practicing in parks. It seemed safer. Um, Interesting, like, like kids now are the least safe thing to photograph, but uh, at the time it felt safer. Uh, and working in this very deadpan way, and I just, uh, I wasn't asking people to perform, just stand there. And don't smile, don't frown, just relax. Now I was using, for most of these, a larger camera, so that allows for some time for them to relax. I even, for a period of time, brought along a chair with me so that they could just like, just settle down and not have to move around. And what was interesting is the more I did this, the more I found myself attracted to certain people, certain types of people. Um, this fellow walking around with a radio. Here's a little video we made of me approaching someone a number of years ago to try to answer this question. It's, a ho it's really embarrassing because so much of what I do is talk people into stuff. And, and that's, this is the nice Nelly issue, is that you have to do this. It's like being one of those people on the street handing out you know, pamphlets. It's, it's unpleasant. And I don't love it, but I, like, I have to do it. Look at all those hand gestures. And, but the key thing is that all this time, the person is, the subject is just standing there. And that allows them to kind of let go a little bit, relax. Maybe they're thinking about, like, when's this going to finish? Or what am I going to have for lunch? But there's less performance when you work that way. Um, I don't think we have time for this. I'll do that last question there. And then, yeah. Can you speak a little on how journalism has impacted your I, um, the difference between photojournalism and art? Absolutely, that's a great question. Um, because I had no ambition to be a photojournalist ever. And, you know, I did come from painting, I wanted to be an artist. Uh, I, it felt totally unrealistic. I, I went to school at Sarah Lawrence College in, in New York and I interned different galleries and artists and I realized, like, this is impossible. Um, and particularly if I live in Minnesota, which I sort of had to do at the time. And I just thought, well, I'm just going to keep making my work and find my, you know, and just, you know, hope for the best. And uh, I ended up getting that suburban newspaper photography job. And, and that was not deeply inspirational. Uh, and so eventually I left that. And I thought there was really no connection with journalism. Uh, and then I had this breakout year and all my work got out in the world and I suddenly had an art career and I thought, oh my God, what am I going to do for a living because this isn't going to last and I don't have an MFA, I can't teach and, uh, and so I started doing magazine work and, and eventually applied to Magnum Photos, this legendary agency full of photojournalists and I learned so much about the world through that process. Um, and through my colleagues in Magnum, and through doing these assignments. Sometimes they were terrible, uh, and, and I blew it big time. But I learned how to very quickly engage with the world, and, and I learned about you know the ethics of journalism, um, which I, it's not to say I always abide by, but I, uh, that universe played a role. And, and for the last uh, four years, I've been collaborating with Magnum photographers on a project and working with everyone from hardcore photojournalists like Paolo Pellegrin to Susan Mizellis uh, to Jim Goldberg, you know, mu much more art photographers. And we're working together to make something. And it's what I've learned is that these lines are incredibly blurry. <laughs> and, and there you have it. So I think it's 129. I've been told to end at 130. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.
You're the model speaker, Alec. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing the power of storytelling and for reminding us that photography can be fun. And especially thank you for contributing one of your works to our silent auction. So, yes. Oh, it's to our live auction. Take it back, our live auction, so you can see it. Thank you all.